Who was really your mo- number one most <laughs> impressive performance? From the weekend? Yeah. Ah, geez, it's a good question, actually. Uh, who was number one? I was impressed with what Geelong did um, yeah. Friday night. We've been sort of, you know, talking about them a little bit. St Kilda were extremely impressive. They're probably the two without um, sort of thinking about it. And your most depth. disappointing? Uh, most disappointing, probably just probably Hawthorne on the back of the way that yeah, they actually yeah. played. But I think overall, in terms quickly. of the big picture, I think um, I think Adelaide were most disappointing. Mm. Thought they got, um, yeah, thought they got completely um, sort of exposed at either end of the ground, both in their D fifty and Ford fifty um, against a team who was missing half of their midfield. Um, I don't want to uh, upset your yeah. format because I know you spend uh, enormous amounts of time uh, articulating everything, so it's in uh, segments. <laughs> so we'll get stuck into it. Uh, your overall observations. Yeah, so just, you know, only you know two games in, three games in so, um, for some teams. But I can imagine last year, I think we spoke about it on the show, that um, it was pretty straightforward in terms of, um, you know, the ruck conversation last year in terms of who was going to be um, All-Australian, yeah. you know, and that was Tim English. Kieran Briggs last year had an unbelievable sort of finish to the year, but just didn't play enough games to qualify. So, you know, it was a pretty boring sort of conversation, which has been sort of strange given, you know, the, um, you know, over, the, you know, probably the previous six, seven years, you know, Gorn, Grundy, Nat and Nui, we've had sort of, you know, some elite yep. top end ruckmen, if you like. So to have a year, you know, like last year was pretty strange. But I think this year, I've, I think we're going to have that conversation back again if the first two or three weeks are anything to go by. So, you know, Luke Jackson at the moment, it's going to be, you know, an interesting conversation as the year goes on when Sean Darcy comes back. But clearly at the moment, off, off the form that he's playing with at the moment, he's going to be in all Australian conversation if he continues going mm. down that way. And I'll get into him later on in the show. But he's so important in terms of what's happening with Fremantle at the moment throughout that midfield. Kieran Briggs, you know, you know, we've sort of spoken about him at length on this show. Yep. He came into the side at round 10 last year, round 11 last year. And it's not all on the one individual, I understand that, but GWS's win-loss um, you know, record since he's come into the team at round 11 has been sort of, you know, unbelievable, um, if you like. So his ability to get involved in all aspects of the, of the game um, is through the roof at the moment. Tim English set the scene, I thought, along with Bont, um, you know, in that first quarter, you know, probably that first 10, 15 minutes. I know he was playing against Ned Moyle um, on the weekend, but, you know, his ability to be able to, you know, get involved in that clearance and actually get, you know, three of their first four goals on the scoreboard through that was um, was fantastic. I thought Riley O'Brien was actually pretty dominant on, um, on Friday night um, as well. Unfortunately, he just didn't have enough mates to go with him. Max is Max. We know Max is going to be, um, you know, in this conversation conversation probably until the day that he retires and the other one Cameron hey yeah what about Cameron Darcy Cameron he's actually started okay he's yeah yeah, he's actually been one of the only ones that kind of one that yeah that's actually improved um on last year and then the other one's Rowan Marshall I thought Rowan Marshall's game on the weekend was um was superb and I thought his game in round one against Geelong I thought he was probably the reason as to why they almost got back into that um you know, into that game and, and had a win. So there's six to seven names that we've just thrown out right now. It's only two or three games in, but it's just good to have that debate and that conversation, I guess, um, you know, with, um, you know, some significant names in that um, in that grouping. Kane, I spoke to an AFL coach uh, on the weekend. He said that the new ruck rule where you can just stick your arm out is killing tall coach, uh, tall ruckman. Say that again. The... the the Max Gorn rule where you can just uh, yeah. straight arm the opposition ruckman. Yeah. He, he says it's killing tall ruckman. I thought it would kill off jumping ruckman. Killing tall uh, ruckman. I'm, I'm not sure why. I haven't I haven't seen enough evidence they're to all suggest. Tall, they're all tall, aren't they? Like, yeah, there's not will... many that tower over each other. Like, I mean, Mason Cox is tall, but the others mm. are sort of at 203 to 207, mm. aren't they? Do you think the rule has had any impact? No, I think to, to Horny's point, I think it's been excellent for the craft of a ruckman. I think it's probably brought them more into the game and given them another string to their bow in terms of being able to use tactics and technique and strength and the work they do in the gym and the experience. Ruckmen are now exposing the lesser lights. Like to your point, Riley O'Brien, I, I, I was with you, Horny. I thought he exposed Stanley. Mm. I just thought that was a battle of strength that Stanley couldn't win. And maybe, yeah, maybe Jared last year, he could have jumped a little bit more over him and used his athleticism, but now he can't. So 
I really like that rule coming back in, and it should never, in 2003, on the back of Matthew Primus's dominance, been taken out. It should. <laughs> it, goes, it goes back to a Port Adelaide I, I, issue. Well, it does. They, they, they made it the Primus rule. He was the dominant ruckman by yeah. being able to use that tactic. They got rid of it because of that, and now 20 years later, we're, we're bringing it back bringing in. Bringing it so, back. Hoiny, the ruckman is back. I like it. Um, I still wouldn't pay big money for a ruckman unless they were like completely something special because I think you can get a Van Soldo. I think you can get one like that and, and still be quite effective. There's still the veterans having an impact. Goldstein's been pretty solid. So unless you are really special, I'm reserving my money for the game-breaking well, midfielders only two, and forwards. Yeah, well, there's only two of that grouping that have been taken with high-end high end picks, if you like, and a high-end pick being you know, a top-20 selection. Mm. So, yeah, Luke Jackson, I think, is that special mm. talent. And I think his point of difference is actually what he does on the deck as opposed to his actual pure ruck work. Swans took a ruckman with their first draft pick this year. I haven't, mm. I haven't followed him in the no, twos. I wouldn't know. No. Don't know? Okay, no. we'll follow that up. All yep. right, let's talk about your seven main talking points, and you want to start with the Saints. Yeah, so you know, I probably want to do this in you know maybe a week or two weeks, and just quickly just go through every team if you like, and you know we just we just want to identify one area of improvement that we're purely looking at, um, you know, for every team, you know, on the back of what they did in twenty twenty three, and how can they improve in that area in twenty twenty four? So we'll do that, you know, with a four or five game sample, but I just want to do it with St Kilda if I can. So. Yeah, so St Kilda's ability, you know, to connect going inside 50 was the worst in the competition last year. But we're only, you know, only two games into their season so far. But their connection and, the, and, and um, you know, the look ahead of the game just looks so different and so, and so dangerous this year. And I talked about, um, you know, it might have been last week or the week before, but, you know, three of the last four premiers have all been number one in the competition for scoring from back half work, not scoring from forward half work, which is what we've sort of spoken about at length, yep. you know, for probably the last 10, 15 years. St Kilda kicked 23 goals this year. 15 of them have come off the back of their explosive ball movement from behind centre. That's a ridiculous percentage. Mm. And the percentage where I reckon maybe, you know, Three, four, five, six years ago, we would have been looking at going, geez, is that actually unsustainable? But you know, I think that's where the game is slowly starting to change. And that's off the back of probably you know the best player in the competition off our 100x ratings last year, Jack Sinclair, not having a great preseason, mm. missing round one, and probably still going to take another four, five, six weeks to actually get going. So, you know, Colin so was... the half forward flankers are going to end up being defenders, and the defenders are being. Becoming yeah, the well, so that's a good that's a good point, and I watched the obviously the Port game closely, and what Burn Jones did to Rioli yep. is something that I yep. think some teams will start doing. We've already seen it with Sicily. I don't suspect now it's a different role, but I don't suspect Tom Stewart standing on his own again this year. Well, if the opposition is smart, he won't be. So, Hoyne, I I I get what you're saying, and you were big on this last week, and you're ahead of the curve with it. But I don't think teams are going to give up on this. I, I, I think they're going to come with plans to, to shut this down. And I don't uh, think the Saints will be immune to that. Uh, you can't possibly give up on it. If you're going to give up on it, well, you're pretty mm. much white, you know, waving the white flag. Do you think Sydney's – I mean, do you think you can stop – so Sydney's the one where I look at it and go, oh, well, there's, there's five of them. Good luck. And their midfielders get back and they start the chain as well. That's the one I think is that stoppable. Can you but, stop Sydney? But I think with the Swans, I think it's more their mids that get back to actually get involved in that chain and then explode out. I mean, if I have a look at Sydney's halfback flankers, I mean, Blakey clearly is, is that player. But then if I look at Florin and if I look at Lloyd, like mm. they're not they're not those players mm -hmm. to me. Like, you know, they're able to win the ball, but they don't have that explosiveness and that creativity with ball in hand. Braden Campbell potentially does. They're winning but it's more, get back yeah, and it's correct. Quiet. But it's more Goulden getting back and then it's more Heaney getting back and Warner, you know, yeah. and then Warner getting back and then those guys exploding, which makes it sort of hard to That's defend. That's why I think it's harder to stop. Yeah, and you mm. yeah, and you might be right, and that's where you know I mentioned last week with Paul Adelaide and you know Dan Houston and Ryan Burton's becoming that player as well. I mean, like when Ryan Burton gets ball in hand, his mm. ability to be able to slice through you is almost second to none in the competition. But the Saints, the Saints have this as well. And last year, Collingwood, Collingwood showed that you know the ability to be able to actually win it back across that half back area, so from that centre circle to the defensive fifty metre line, the absolute pure you know counter punch area, if you like, that was the reason why they got through to grand final day and won the flag last year. 
So far, St Kilda, their ability to be able to win it back in that area of the ground and then explode from there is absolutely rock solid at the moment and was the reason why they got such a heavy scoreboard return against Collingwood. But then more importantly, their ability to defend that area going back the other way. Collingwood had 38 opportunities in that area of the ground against St Kilda. Again, the number one team in the competition last year. They scored four times. Mm. So they've got both sides of the footy down pat St Kilda in the most important area of the ground. So love what they're doing. They're getting the game that they want. I thought that what Chris Scott and Geelong did against them in, in the first game of the year you know, to get involved in close to 70 stoppages. St Kilda don't want that. St Kilda want the game on the outside. They want a ping pong, a running game. They got that against Collingwood with, you know, with just over 50 stoppages um, against Collingwood. So that's going to be a huge test for Essendon on the weekend. Essendon don't want a stoppage game. Usually, can they actually do something to actually stop the speed well, and offense? Well, on well the that Saints? was going to be my next question. I know you've got the Bombers on your radar a, a little bit later on, so I don't want to tread on your toes there. But um, th- this is a fascinating game because if, if Max King isn't playing, if Peter Wright isn't playing, the Saints got some other injuries with Wood to, to go along with Howard and Webster's out. So th- they've got some challenges but mm. the Bombers refuse to defend, or they don't know how to defend. And how long have we been speaking about this? So if you're telling me the Saints are experts at moving the ball from back half to forward half, the Bombers continually get cut up in that area, surely the Saints just win this game. Well, we might as well do the Bombers now, if we're, if, if we're on it. Yeah, and if just, if and Kane's just jumping the queue, let's no, do it. No, no, well, no, they, play, they play he, each he, other, so it was the right time. Mate, he's, he should be a producer and talent. He's, just <laughs> got, he, he's got the whole thing <laughs> down pat. It's just the order I've put together is just absolutely throw that out. So yeah. <laughs> that's just a rookie mistake. But, um, yeah, so I just want to touch on the Bombers, Kane, as you, as you said. And just first and foremost, just, you know, give them a little bit of praise in terms of what they're doing with their clearance game. Their clearance game against Hawthorne was superb and their clearance game against Essendon, um, against Sydney with a midfield that is absolutely flying at the moment was good enough to be able to break even yeah. um, in, in that aspect of the game. So that midfield group in terms of what they're doing offensively, well done. They're going extremely well. Their ability to be able to score has never been an issue. They're able to score both from forward half and back half so far across their first um, you know two weeks of the season. So a huge tick. I don't, I don't want to be boring, but I feel like I am going to be boring with this. The only, you know, like St Kilda, looking at what they're going to do with that connection piece going inside 50, again, I feel like for, you know, the sixth, seventh, eighth year in a row, purely looking at all we want to know about Essendon is, are they going to invest and are they going to be able to deny opposition ball movement? And we're only two games in, but the sample is, unfortunately, it's a no. Mm. So the three easiest teams in the competition after, after two games or three games to actually move the footy against, Essendon are the easiest, West Coast are the second easiest, and North Melbourne are the third easiest. And in all due respect to West Coast and North, you do not want to be in the same conversation as those two teams when you might be considered a team to be playing top four, top six, top eight sort of style of footy. And I just want to dive into it a little bit. So, like... Just think about the ability to be able to move the ball from one end of the ground to the other. Usually you score, on average, three to four times per game, scoring from D50 to forward 50. So over a two-week period, maybe seven times, Mm. you'll score from D50 to forward 50. Essendon have conceded 19 scores in two weeks Mm. from their D50 work. I mentioned it on the show last week. No one really talked about it in the industry last week because Hawthorne kicked one goal six out of their D50 work. So it gets missed because of the inaccuracy. Sydney on the weekend kicked five seven mm. from their D fifty work. So to just to put that into into context for those that are listening, so nineteen scores. Go back for the last ten years for any two game stretch over the course of a season, it's the third worst two game stretch we've seen over ten years. Further context to that, the worst stretch was Brisbane, who gave up twenty one scores in twenty sixteen. They finished second last that year. Mm. The second worst stretch in a ten year period was North Melbourne, who gave up 20 scores in 2021. They won the wooden spoon. Essendon are next now. 19 scores Mm. in two weeks. That's not great company. No, it's bad company. And a lot of Essendon supporters listening to that will be saying, oh, it's personnel. We're missing Ridley. We're missing various other people, Redmond. So what's your answer to that? Nothing to do with personnel. Okay. Can I read you you something that... Zach Merritt, the captain, said in February 2023, so over a year ago at Captain's Day, he said, talking to other players on Captain's Day, we are probably seen as an offensive, quick, run-and-gun team that's not going to win finals football. 
So we need to evolve and be more balanced in the contest and balance with offense and defense. He said, you can't win games consistently if you are not really good in the contest defensively. We need to prove, We know we need to improve in that area. The data is obvious. It's pretty clear that we've been a really poor defensive team, clearly for a number of reasons, which we have to address and improve. It won't happen consistently. It won't happen in round one, probably, but we know we need to start to build that out quickly. That was 12 months ago, and you're telling me, Horny, there's been no improvement. But... Uh, <laughs> And without being so that's, that's, so that's super that's, harsh so just on it. For, well, we have to because that's that's the frustration that I have with this. And there's there's a but, lot of talk like that from Merritt, and, you, and he's leading the. I get it. He's leading the way. He's doing all he can, and I can sense that he he wants to be good. But they're not coming along with him, and that must frustrate Bombers fans. That wouldn't be the only article where he's quoted in saying that. You could pull out probably fifteen more where different players have said similar along those lines. They know it, but they refuse to fix it. Well, they don't know how to fix it. So, yeah. Horny, without being harsh, you were going to say? Yeah, Kane, you said that's a 12-month problem, yep. if you like. It's far longer mm. than that. Like, this is, in all honesty, this is a this is a six, seven, eight year so sort Horny, of problem. Like this, I, I, and this isn't, and, and Brad's, you know, now, what is he, 25 games into his coaching stint. But, it, you know, it was the same under Rutten, and it was the same before that, um, you know, under Worsfold as well, and... Um, yeah, and like I don't want to sound boring, but it, it's it is becoming a little bit boring. Like we're not seeing anything different, and that's why Saturday night under the roof against a team that that is their strength at the moment. Let's sit back again and let's see it for another 120 minutes, and let's see if it if it has improved. Because yeah, you know, so the do you think it's work so right, far. not getting back quickly enough, or is it maybe they're attacking? and not structuring up behind the ball that the Giants talk well, so much about. So we talk about with the ball movement game in terms of, you know, offensively and defensively, the unsung heroes are those small half forward flankers that get up and back, mm. up and back. So you think about flag favorites at the moment, GWS. Yep. They've brought in a young kid who looks like he's 15 years old, yep. Thomas, and his role is just to just get up and back mm. to couple Brent Daniels and to couple Toby um, and to couple um, Toby Bedford. Yep. You look at what you know Collingwood were able to do last year: Ginevan, McCreary, Hill. You know, get up and get back. Geelong with you know Close and Myers and Stengel. Now they bring in Manor as well to get up and back, up and back. Richmond absolutely started it. Yep. Butler, Rioli, Castagna, get up and back, up and back. Look at Essendon and, you know, Jai Menzi is in that team at the moment to do that role. But who else is there in that Ford 50? I'll touch on Gresham later on, but he's not going to do that. Stringer's not going to do that. Langford's not going to do that. Who are these you know, workers? Are these role players? Carlton have taken, you know, Matt Cottrell from being a winger to playing him across half forward. And all you're going to do, Matt Cottrell, is run up and back, up and back for us. That's all you're going to do. Mm. So, and it, so start, it starts to get real. So we, we, we see them beat Hawthorne, a pretty good performance against Sydney, but let's have a look at it. So it's the Saints, no Peter Wright with the challenges that you're outlining, Horny. It's Port Adelaide in Adelaide. It's the Western Bulldogs who can cut you and mm. slice you and dice you with the best of them. It's Adelaide in Adelaide. Who knows yep. with that, but usually a pretty difficult proposition. Dangerous. Then... It's Collingwood at the MCG. So their next five, they're not going to start favourite in any of those five. And the prospect of being um, one and six is real, season over, and there's going to be serious heat on the Essendon Football Club. So they'd want to click into gear now, despite the first couple of rounds being, being okay and them largely escaping any scrutiny. But it's about to get real um, for the Essendon Football Club. We're going to find out a lot about them. Um, where do we start with the pies? Yeah, so clearly everyone knows what the issue is at the moment. And the issue appears to be that, you know, their inability to defend turnover, which is the biggest red flag you can have in your game or the biggest green flag you can have in their game. Yeah, clearly, um, you know, Sydney and GWS have the green flag in that area. Collingwood, right now, the, you know, the red flag couldn't be waving any harder, if you like. 69 points per game off turnover last year. They gave up 40. It's a five goal. It's a five goal difference. So what's actually happening at the moment? So you know when you break down the turnovers, you know there's 70 per game. So so to lump them all in together is a, is a little bit misleading. So what we do, we separate them out into the absolute howlers, what we call giveaways, when you're purely just giving the ball straight back to the mm. opposition and they've done nothing to win it back. That's the area of the game which is absolutely killing Collingwood at the moment. When they're giving the ball back to the opposition and they've just been too good to actually win it back, Collingwood are actually defending 
that turnover, you know, that turnover okay. When they gave the ball back to the opposition last year and gifted it straight back to them, they gave up a score one in six times. Mm. That was extremely, you know, extremely positive on their end. When they're giving it back this year, they're giving up a score one in every four times. Mm. That's a big, that's a big jump. Well, in terms of so exemplified by the Sydney game, yeah, where the turnover just resulted in so many goals, so many goals. So that's that's the issue defensively. Then the issue offensively. We just talked about with St Kilda their ability to explode, um, to explode off the half back line, if you like. Collingwood's ability to be able to do that last year was their point of difference. Yep. Last year, when they won the ball back across that half back area, they scored one in every five times. This year, they're scoring one in every ten. So they've lost the defensive aspect. Yep. Now they've lost the offensive aspect. There's alarm bells going everywhere. And, you know, and me and King, we're doing a little bit of work on this today and he's going to present something tomorrow or Thursday night around Jordan Degoe and his impact in this phase of the game, which is absolutely, you know, which is just completely dropped off. But where to start? Everyone knows the issue. So what's the solution, if you like? And with your, and with your turnover and transition game being absolutely broken offensively and defensively, to me, it's got to, if, if I'm calling with Thursday night, I'm bringing this game into the trenches and making it a dogfight and starting and starting with that phase of the game. Because if I'm going to, if I'm going to play this expansive game and try and play this turnover game and, you know, and, and what have you, at the moment, you're so far off it. Grand final day last year, I thought the way they coached was absolutely brilliant and, and, and sort of, you know, probably didn't get, didn't get the recognition that, that it deserved. They created 80 stoppages in 30 degree heat mm. against Brisbane because they didn't want to get involved in, in, in the transition game. It worked beautifully. They gave the ball back to Brisbane only 49 times. Their lowest, you know, throughout any game last year. I think that's where they need to get to because GWS, Sydney and, um, and St Kilda have only allowed them to have 50 stoppages per game. So they've made it a running game. They've made it a transition game because they know that's where they're, you know, sort of vulnerable at mm. the moment. I think for Collingwood, bring it into the trenches Thursday night and you're going to be a chance. If you don't, you're in trouble. You got a quick guess who question for yeah, us? Guess who? Last 12 months, AFL number one interceptor at ground level, James Sicily. AFL number two, who is it? James Sicily is the number one interceptor at ground level over the last 12 months. Who is number two? I don't know why I'm going to say Lockie Whitfield, but I am, and I'd be wrong, Hoiny. But was, uh, it, was it a decent guess or not? Uh, no. No. I'm going for Nick. Sorry, I, wanted to, I wanted to be kind. He's got a few teammates that are in the list, okay, but unfortunately right. he's not one of them. Nick Dacos? Uh, Dacos is not a bad guess, but no, he's not He's not there as well. Is he a small so, or a tall? No, he's a small. He's a small, mm. so he does it in different ways. Does he it plays. Does anyone he, have a good crack off the... Uh, off the I tell you who he, I tell you who he plays for. Do you want me to give you the team? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It plays for the dogs. Okay. Is it Richards? He's a start. Ed Richards came. Right. Ed he Richards was good on the so, weekend. So I think yeah I think quite often um, yeah the intercept mark is the is the is the easiest one to identify and the easiest one to sort of yeah, yep. appreciate um, if you like but you know you think about it that there's seventy intercepts that are available each week and there's you know on average fifteen to sixteen that are taken in the air so there's fifty five that are available or thereabouts. Um, what's more damaging? Uh, what's more an intercept mark's more damaging? You know that's the more you know that's the most pure um, intercept. You know along with a free kick, um, you know uh, as well. But um, yeah, so the intercept mark's more damaging. Mm. But the ability to be able to win at a gra- at ground level is um, is so important. So his ability to be able to do that over the last you know so uh, over the last twelve months is he's in a good list. You know so James Sicily is number one. Ed Rich is number two. Sam Taylor, everyone lords. He's he's number three. His partner in crime, Connor Ida, number four. And these are on the ground, not in on the the ground, yeah. yeah. Adam Sard's up there as well. Jake Lever and Jake Buckley. So you know, Kane, Lockie Whitfield's got three three mm. teammates in the top six or top yeah, seven. I just didn't, didn't um, get anywhere in, near any of that, them anyway. In, in that area, so it is it is something. So we had him last year on the hundred X rating as as um, as number thirty five um, in the competition and sitting inside the top ten. Yep. Um, Underrated you know, player, halfback flank is in the competition. So his game on the weekend was superb. His game, you know, round one was actually quite good um, as well. So I think we're just going to appreciate this guy a little bit more than probably what we have over the last um, over the last 12 to 18 months. James right. Sicily, All-Australian last year. He was. How's he travelling this year? No, he hasn't started too well. Poor. hasn't had the impact. He's had a bad yeah, run, has he? He's just been, um, yeah, no, been nullified, um, if you like, in the first um, you know, two weeks of the season.
Tell me about Grian Myers because he caused a stir last year. Everyone started to say that he deserved more recognition. And has he gone to a new level early days this year? Yeah, I just want to have a bit of a broader discussion around around this guy and just his um, importance to the team. So over the last 12 months, so you know, 2023 and 2024, so when he has 20-plus disposals, Geelong are 9 and 3. When he has under 20, they're 3 and 9. Take that even further. When he has under 15, they've won one of five games mm. when he's had under 15. Mm. I'm just throwing it out there. If I'm Hawthorne this week, I'm sending Finn McGinnis straight to him. Mm. I, know that's a little, I, know, I know that's a little bit different, but you know the Geelong midfield without Dangerfield um, in there for this week, I, I, this guy, I, I'll be interested. I'm always interested, and you'll probably know this you know, 100 times more than me, G, but you know, he, he's, never, he, you know, he's never really had that hard attention. Um, mm. you know, before. So I'm always interested in terms oh. of, you know, the first time that you get it, how hard it is to actually well, deal with it. Well, you see how hard it is. Clayton Oliver had it basically yeah. for the first time last Clay- year, got 13 And, and Clayton's had it numerous times throughout his career. Yeah. Brian's never had it before. No. So I, that's where I'll be sending the McGuinness magnet to it. And like, just like it. And just testing Geelong in terms of if you shut this guy down, he's so important in terms of what you do. And then just further to that. If he did get that, tagged, though, you'd be sticking him straight back to the forward pocket, wouldn't you? But that's not his role. His role, no. his role is to run and get involved all around the ground. And Sean Burgoyne asked him post game, "Yeah, what's your role?" And he said, "I'll leave that to you guys to figure out. I'm not going <laughs> to give it away," <coughs> which is fair enough. But you know, by all reports, Finn McGuinness is one of the elite runners as well at Hawthorne. Yeah. So I think he might be able to go with him. And just further to that, you know, the game's all about you know, can you get your score? You know, can you get your possession on the scoreboard if you like, and get involved in those scoreboard, um, you know, sort of chains if you like. Last twelve months. This is the group that he's in. This is for, um, for overall score involvements. So Christian Petraka, number one, star. Charlie Kerno, number two. Toby Green, number three. Stephen Canilio, number four. Bont, five. Butters, six. Myers comes in at number seven. Rosie, eight. Taylor Walker, nine. Shy Bolton, and then Dusty. That's, that's an unbelievable company. list, and yep. he sits number seven. That's why, he, you're the, that's why you're the smartest bloke in footy. He you? is so important, and I'm big on what Geelong can do this year. I think we've seen it the first yeah. two weeks, and I think people might be starting to get on board. But I think there's got to be more attention paid to this, and I think if that's going to start, it could start with the perfect person this um, you know, this coming Monday in Finn McGuinness. We could be sitting here Tuesday night and he, and, you know, and he might not have gone to him. Myers might have had unbelievable impact again. Or we could be sitting there and we could be saying, yeah, you know, we, um, just, we had a look at it. I loved nothing more than tagging someone for the first time that had never been tagged. Right. They, yeah. They've got no idea what to do. And they, they <laughs> hate, they, like, they look at you like, well, you're coming to me? And you know before the balls even bounce, you've, you've got, got them. Because they've got no, no idea. They've got no idea the work rate that's required. It completely throws them off. So I Can, really like – now, Finn needs a big game. Oh, this may be the last toss of the coin. Be lucky for, to stay on the side, but you may have just got him in Sam Mitchell. We'll be listening to the program. So, Kane, did you, did you ever tag a, a flanker? Or was it purely purely your centre bounce? It was, it was, midfielders? It was mainly – on ballers or attacking halfbacks. Okay. Um, Is it? Because yeah. I I was not comfortable going deep um, in the goal school. So they'd often see me and take me deep. And I didn't quite have the defensive craft to stop a dangerous forward. So if I went to someone like Gary Ablett Jr., he would go deep forward and you feel a bit yeah. uncomfortable there. So it, was, it wasn't usually the high half forward. But occasionally, do I remember doing Richard Douglas one day? He was playing sort of that high half forward role. Yep. And they look at that, I don't know what, they got no idea what to do. So mm. I really like the suggestion. And for a player that's never been tagged before, um, it, it does freak them out. So we'll see. But as I said, last roll of the dice for Finn, he needs a big game, yeah. which leads us to the Hawks. Um, well, yeah. wait, wait, there's been a, I've been challenged on my views on the Hawks. I'm obviously glass half full with them. Others are, are thinking they're getting off scot-free. Are they on the right path, Horny, or not? You've got some concerns. Oh, I think the expectation is always is always interesting. I think the expectation can actually sort of, you know, you know, create various different conversations in a positive or a negative sense. And I think, you know, quite a few in the industry had higher expectations on Hawthorne, you know, potentially to win, you know, eight to ten games or potentially even get close to top eight. And I think the reality was off the back of what they did last year, it was impressive at times in terms of just how aggressive they were with their ball movement and how aggressive they were against Collingwood and Brisbane in particular. Um, but the reality is that, you know, their overall season, you know, their profile was still a long way off in terms of, you know, being that 
eight to 10 to 12 sort of, you know, win team season. So I think, you know, perhaps the expectation was a bit unrealistic, which then creates this you know, sort of conversation. I think, you know, how they played against Melbourne in particular in that first quarter, you know, was probably, you know, the biggest surprise. Um, you know, if you like, that's not what we saw no. from Hawthorne last year, which made them, you know, da- you know, a dangerous team that if you're off like a Brisbane or a Collingwood, they would get you because they challenged you offensively. In many cases, it seemed to me, and I spoke to Sam Mitchell before the game and he sort of told us that this is what they were going to do. Mm. And it seemed to me they were more worried about Melbourne's strengths than their own. Yeah, challenge. Uh, and I'll be surprised if we see that this yeah. week against Geelong on Monday, which, you know, I think makes it a semi-dangerous game for Geelong yeah. um, on, on Monday, if you like. But, you know, we just had a, um, a text machine, um, you know, sort of just come through with a message around Hawthorne's midfield. And I just wanted to get into that. I mean, they've been absolutely assaulted um, at centre bounce. It's the worst It's the worst start to a season that we've seen from any team in terms of raw scoreboard differential at clearance. So to be minus 93 over a two-week period, we've never seen that before. To start the clearance, year. Clearances in total. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yes. Um, points from clearance differential. And I just want to put it on, just on a couple of, of their midfielders. So we're only really seeing, you know, Newcomb, um, Nash and Warple as the permanent centre yep. bouncers. You know, a little bit of, um, you know, um, Cam McKenzie going through there and a little bit of Josh Ward. But they're the main ones. Newcomb, to me, is the one who has, who has significantly dropped away to mm. start the season. So his ability to be able to win a first possession at stoppage, he's done it eight times. But then for Hawthorne to be then, you know, able to convert that possession and then get out, that's only happened four times. Mm. So a return of one in every two. AFL average is, you know, you know, close to that eight in ten times you actually win that possession and then get out. So he's not been able to actually either handle it and then get out and then, you know, release a teammate if you like. Will Day, the loss of Will Day mm. in this aspect of the game is you know, has been massive. Mm. Um, and, and I think, you know, with a young group and you lose your best player from last year, um, you know, the returns that that's sort of, you know, had on the team has been significant. But if they're going to get this aspect of the game back, it's going to, it, it, it you know, it has every opportunity to start on Monday, given that Dangerfield's not going to be there, potentially Atkins is not going to be there, Cam Guthrie's not going to be mm. there. So that's half of their midfield group missing. Geelong have either end of the grounds ticked off at the moment. They're playing really solid footy. But that midfield, like Adelaide did on the weekend, they were able to get a hold of them from a clearance perspective. But can they actually get this going, Hawthorne, and get that asset back? Because that's, um, yeah, it's just been, it's been a real shock um, to actually see the returns that they've delivered in that phase of the game to start mm. the season.